What up? Well, the Cincinnati Bengals are moving forward. Who saw that coming? Some of you guys are like, what's the, what is he talking about? I'm talking about football, all right? So I'm excited. I feel like you guys didn't go there with me, all right? But it's okay because I understand where you guys are all at, and I'm with you, okay? I'm saying stand strong in your faith. And once again, I say stand, all right? Because I don't believe Thomas is retiring, and I need you guys to stay with me on this one. And if you say otherwise, I will cry right now for an hour and a half, and that'll be the message, all right? Man, you guys doing good? I thought I had an intro video worth of time to get my computer set up to preach the message, and that didn't happen, so here we go. I hope it just doesn't go to sleep mode, though. Like, I feel like my, that's what my computer and myself have in common. Just, just at any moment, like, I'm out. I'm done. All right, here we go. Okay, we're going to jump into the word. We're on a part two of a fear, facing fear and anxiety message that that I'm loving. I, I love last week's. Go and check it out. We're actually going to be dropping out the messages in podcast form onto Spotify. And we, we've just finishing up editing last week. So also find the messages on YouTube. You can find the full service on YouTube. We're actually going to be compressing those down as well because I believe that we got to get the word of God out to anybody and everybody as often as we can. So this way people can experience breakthrough, experience breakthrough. And like I said before, I'm not going to, I'll probably say every week, but I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to unpack it like on a bigger level every week. But man, if, so, if God breathes something tonight on your heart that you think could set somebody free, man, put it out on your Instagram story. Tag, a, tag the mezzanine in it because people are watching your account. People are watching you. People are watching your life. And you know what? You don't always, this isn't like 1951 where you got to like walk up to somebody and be like, if you died today, do you know where you would go? I mean, you could tell G people about Jesus in a lot of other different creative ways. So that's just one of them out there. Let's do it. Let's jump into the word. What do you guys say? You ready? Let's pray. Lord, you are so good. God, you are so good. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. You got two scriptures tonight, God. That's it. Two powerful scriptures. Let us just grab a hold of them and apply them to our lives, Lord. Apply them to our lives. And we can experience just a freedom in you and in Christ, and that fear and anxiety have got to bow to the name of Jesus. And we're going to walk confident, and we are going to be bold, and we are going to be able to, to go in this world and show people, help people, be able to live in freedom because you've set us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. 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 Well, I tell you what. Man, jumping in, I'm going to read scripture right now. I'm going to read scripture right now so this way because I sometimes go on long tangents of storytelling, all right? So in that, I just wanted to go ahead and, and give the anchor verse for the series. And it says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Incredibly famous scripture. Incredibly famous. And I want to encourage you, highlight that in your YouVersion app. Highlight that in your Bible. We're going to keep unpacking more and more of it this week. We're also going to jump over and we're going to look at 1 Peter here in a little bit. What the Apostle Peter had to say on this moment. And if you're wondering what the authorship, Philippians is written by Paul, and he's written, he's, he, he wrote this epistle, or what's a fancy word for a letter, while he was in prison in a horrible time, in a horrible time of his life. He was, he was awaiting a trial, which inevitably would wind up to be his death. And he's saying, rejoice in the Lord always. Be anxious for nothing. That's incredible. That's incredible. I'd love to learn how to do that. I think now I can help some of you guys in your journey and give you some wisdom tonight on how God's used these scriptures in my life and in others' lives to be able to make this a reality for us. But can I tell you something? That you might not hear anything new tonight that you haven't heard before 
So if you're a Christian and you've been to church, I might not say anything new, but that doesn't mean it's not true. The question is, are you doing it? Everybody ever try to lose weight? Everybody got to say, you need to burn more calories than you take in. I'm sure you, that isn't the first time you've heard that. But do we do it? Not while we have Taco Tuesdays. No, sir. I'll burn some tacos going in. That's what I do. Where the struggle lies isn't in believing what we're hearing is true. Often it is in believing we can carry it out. You see, it's in your mind. Fear, anxiety. These battles take place in your mind and in your heart. That's where they take place. I'm going to teach some people. Who's never won a fight in here? All right, for everybody watching online, Wyatt, please put your hand down. All right. All right. I'm going to teach you how to win a fight. You ready? You ready, Hannah? I'm going to teach you how to win a fight. I'm going to teach you how to win a fight. All right. Got second place in the nation for kickboxing, 1999. I love, I love sport fighting. I wish I was 20 years younger. I would definitely, without a hesitation, go right back into it. And what you do is this. What you do is this. It's really simple. Forget everything you know. All right? Dylan, forget everything you know. The second that bell rings, I don't care. I'm, I'm telling you, it's a true story. I had to fight this guy. It was like my second fight ever, my first fight ever in the ring. I got my butt handed to me. And I was like, in the mighty name of Jesus, please never let that happen again. And my instructor was like, my instructor was like, hey, you want to know what the problem is? And I was like, what's that? He goes, you were scared and he wasn't. And I was like, well, thank you, Mr. Miyagi, for pointing that out. You know. What are you going to do, wash your car and paint your fence now? The second fight, you know what he didn't do? He didn't say, David, before you go in there, you know, it was kickboxing, so we weren't doing like this like cheesy stuff like five-year-olds do. Like he was like, he didn't do any of that, practice your chamber, ha <laughs> ha, you know, none of that. He grabs me by my shirt, and he pulls and gets right in my face, and he says, when that bell rings, like I was like five foot ten, I grew no inches since this moment in my life, all right? This guy was like six foot four, okay? He grabs me and he goes, the second that bell rings, you don't think about a single thing besides running across that ring and punching him dead in the face as hard as you can. I'm like, well, what if he like beats the piss out of me afterwards? He's like, we'll figure that out when we get there. So I'm, I'm like shaking, right? I'm like, uh, uh, here we go. But I'm more dumb and brave than I am anything else. And I was like, that's what he said. Here we go. Sure enough, that guy comes out. He's relaxed. He's won. He's cool. He's got it. He's got it. He's got some. Ding, ding. Like an attacked penguin. I went, what? <laughs> I went right at him. That dude looks up. I punched him in the face so hard. So so hard. He goes back. By the time he could recognize he was in a fight, I'd punched him four more times. I wasn't, I was like, I was like a rabid dog on a bone. I was like, oh, if I stop punching, I'm going to get beat up, you know? <laughs> we go back to our corners after the first round. I'm about to have a heart attack. No way was my cardio training at the level for that, all right? I was like, Ugh. and my coach says the worst thing. He goes, go out there and do it again. I'm like, I'm about to, like, die myself. I walked out there, and I saw it, and it changed my life. When I met eyes with that six-foot-four, majestically beautiful, bleeding man, <laughs> I saw fear. He was scared of me now darn right he should be. Why? Because I wasn't afraid of him. I saw he could get hit. I saw that that fear that I had before I got in the ring was a lie. It was a lie. And that he was walking into that situation with every bit of the apprehension and tension and, 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 and anxiety that I had. What are you dealing with? That's a lie. 
that you're more afraid of something that's fabricated and it's not even the truth. But if you just released yourself and said, you know what, regardless, I'm going to go across this barrier and I'm going to give it everything I've got and I am not going to relent. I am not going to stop. I am just going to keep swinging. He was probably a better fighter than me, to be honest with you. But once fear gets in your heart, you're shut down. That's how they train elephants. You know they only put a chain around a baby elephant's neck? It tries and tries and tries to break it when it realizes that it can't. Now you only need a small rope and string to put around its neck and you can control it the rest of its life. Some of us are walking through this life with strings around our necks, acting like they're chains. And you've been had the strength to break those chains. We got to take a look at it tonight, Mezzanine. We're not called to be captives. We're set free in Christ Jesus. We have got to understand that, that Paul is saying that. Man, he's saying that you're not, we're, not, we're not meant. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But what happens is fear and anxiety get out of place in our life. They don't get put in the right place. They wind up being regulators when they should be indicators. We treat them as regulators. I'm afraid that means I shouldn't go. And then I hear Christians, I'm like, hey, we're going to go and, go and tell that person about Jesus, that classmate, invite him to meds. <coughs> I was going to do a pastor, then I got afraid. And then, they, and then Christians do this, I lost all peace. What? Hold on. Doing what? Loving someone too much? Being too generous? Telling people about Jesus? Um, no, no, you didn't lose peace, you got scared. The enemy would love to use fear to regulate you from advancing the kingdom. But because we got really cool Christianese language that we speak and we can hide behind, that people think that they can't, like, challenge. I love to challenge Christianese. Don't come at me with your Christianese jargon just because you a chicken. All right? Which, by the way, I love chicken, and there's some fried chicken out in the lobby. Thank you, Trinity, for bringing that. No. Don't. Don't make it more educated just to say, I got nervous. Just say that. Say, I want to go talk to him, but I, uh, I got scared. Because when you start lying to yourself, you send yourself off the course that God's placed you on. Because you've got to understand that you can't be operating in lies and stay on a path that's meant to walk in obedience to righteousness. They won't mix, you see. Because God's seeing you a different way than you're seeing you you got to be able to hold to what you know you're setting out to do. Now, don't get me wrong. The peace of God shall umpire our hearts. I'm not saying if you lose peace. I'm saying if you lose peace on something that you know is the right thing, then know you should go out and do. You should take a look at yourself and evaluate because you don't want fear and anxiety to be a regulator. You want it to be an indicator, which means is... When someone goes out to talk to somebody, invite somebody, start their own blog, write that song, do a YouTube channel, go to a university and, and just be obedient to what God's telling you to do, you guess what? Fear's going to hit you. I will not teach you how to live a life without fear. That is a lie. That's trash. I'm a pastor, a mediocre one at best, but I still have fear all the time. It's what I do with it is what counts. I say, whoa, why did I just get afraid? Why, what just happened there? Why? Because I'm a student of my heart. And I'm like, hey, there's that, you know, I'm hanging out with some, guy, some guys, you know. He's like, hey, invite that person to the church. I'm going to invite that, I'm going to talk to that person. I'm going to talk to that person about Jesus. I'm going to ask that person about you know, if I can pray for them, all of a sudden I get all nervous. And, and then, of course, like good Christians, Abraham, we start thinking of our good Christian excuses on why not to do it, you know. And then, I mean, I wish, like, we could hear, the, like, God just every now and then be like, oh, brother, you know. Like, from the clouds, you just get that. <laughs> oh, maybe, oh, brother. Well, no, I mean, God wouldn't sound like that. But that's what happens. Then I say to myself, have I gotten more in love with the moment I'm in than with what my father is calling me to do? Is my ego getting so big 
Am I so tired of being a Christian? I just don't want to do it anymore. That's a reality, people. Sometimes as Christians, we put such a weight on Christians to go to go start a revival in every community they're in that, you know, when someone gets gets like and they get stressed, they get pressured, they get just pounded on by life, then we're like, well, what are you doing for Jesus in this moment? When we should just be kind of asking them, hey, man, how's your soul? Are you okay? You see, when you use it as an indicator, you're able to say, okay, what's going on in my heart? What's going on in my life? If I'm afraid to go tell people about Jesus, if I'm afraid to step out and do what God's called me to do, if I'm afraid, then I want to know because I want to I face that. I don't want to be a prisoner to that. Because if it can stop me there, it can stop me anywhere. People might say, you know what? It's a sin to have anxiety and fear. No, it's not. And then even if someone's like, well, that is debatable. I'm like, no, it's not. It's not debatable. You can debate about it if you want. I'll meet up with you at Applebee's. You can save me a seat and I'll debate you. I won't show up, I promise. But I won't debate you over if, if experiencing fear and anxiety is a sin. It is not, okay? Why? Jesus experienced fear and anxiety in the garden, all right? It's not a sin. It's a sin when you allow it to control your life. It's a sin when it becomes an idol in your life and you constantly bow to it. Because it will devour everything. It has no regard to your own personal journey. It just wants to shut you down every way and everywhere it can. So we can't bow to it. We can't allow it. You can think, guys, think right now. Think of fear more as like, a, like the fuel gauge or the check engine light on your car. It's also not a picture of who you are as a person or your value. It's not. Too often we do that. You know what? How many of you guys, how many of you guys have a car that has the, the, the fuel light on, the gas light? You need gas. Some of you guys have, like, you don't ever be like, oh, well, this car just doesn't work anymore. You know, it just needs gas. You know what I mean? It just needs gas. That's all. That's the only problem with it. You just need to go put the $7.50 that you're probably going to put into it to get it just up and out of the light. So you can drive it around and try and calculate how many miles you went so you don't run out of gas. And you try and stay off the beat line because it's a long stretch between Cocoa Beach and Orlando. And you're probably going to be walking a bit if you take that journey. All the Floridians know what I mean. You see, what happens is because so many things are inundated and pushed at you at such a high pace in this world that you live in. That you don't know what to take as your identity and to take as something that's just, just an indicator light. So fear is not your identity. It's just something to say, hey, listen, we need to address this. We need to look at this. We need to be able to be able to do something about this. But often you have to ask yourself, what do I do about this? Now I'm going to tell you something, what you do about it, and it's not going to be anything new. Nobody is going to fall out of their seat with new divine revelation right now. What do you think I'm going to tell you to do? I'm saying when you feel that fear hit your heart or you feel like anxiety start to come on you. Come on, all my theologians out there. Someone just yell it out. To quote the great prophet M.C. Hammer, you've got to pray just to make it today. Yes. Yes. Pray. Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't do that. you got to pray. When you get nervous about that class, Pray. Indicator life went, light went off. When you're nervous about your relationship, pray. When you're nervous about the doctor's appointment, pray. That's why you're going to be praying consistently. You can't pray too much. When you have a relationship problem with a parent or a friend or, or a romantic one, you should be praying about that consistently, talking to God about it. Not like you're crazy because that will make you, like it says in Colossians, more heavenly minded because that's where the answers lie, not here on earth. You see, we reach up and get the answer from heaven and carry it out here on earth. That's how we beat the fear. And it's not done by watching more TikToks and reading more 12-step program things and going to WebMD and talking to your dumbest friend because I feel like that's the one always available to give you advice at any time because your really successful friends are too busy. 
What do you think I should do? Oh, uh, man, you know. No. If you took that long to say absolutely nothing, do not talk to me. Pray. If it's worrying your mind, then you need to bring it to God's heart. If it's worrying your mind, then you need to bring it to God's heart because he cares. The day we start failing is the day we think he stopped caring. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. I don't understand a lot of things, and I'm proud of that. Algebra, pointless. Never had to use it in my life. (laughs) Forgot where I was going off that one, sunshine. I will be on Instagram because I literally just lost my spot because I'm giggling so hard inside of this leather jacket right now. Don't be anxious. You know what we really should say to each other? Is don't stay anxious. You see, because when you're the friend of the person that's anxious, it's your job to get them to peace and stability. All right? We're not going to be immune to this. And honestly, if there's anxiety over something, it might be a good thing because what you might be doing might be incredibly stupid. If you're going to go and get trashed with your friends and do some stuff that you know isn't God honoring and, you know, you start feeling some anxiety going on inside of you, that's not a bad thing. All right? I don't know if you're going to pray that away. And I don't know if you should. But you know what, if that was an indicator and you said, Father, tell me why I'm feeling this way. And he goes, oh, brother. He wouldn't. You know what he would do? If you're religious, I'm really going to make you mad right now. Because you would love for me to say that alcohol is a sin and don't party like the dirty no good pagans. And you need to be at home reading Leviticus and listening to a Michael W. Smith album. And watching Veggie Tales. That ain't, that ain't going to be what he says. He's going to say, is that, I ma- is, is that who I made you to be? Is that who I made you to be? That lifestyle? That choice? Because that choice ain't going to make me love you less. You see. But it isn't who you were created to be. And then you feel the pain inside, all right? And then you look up and you say, God, why aren't you talking to me? He's like, the problem isn't he's not talking. The problem is you're not talking. Slow down. Pray. You can't be one of my besties. You can't be a bestie with me. Girls have besties. Guys have, well, our buds that have lived through the journey. Can I get an amen? (laughs) You know what I mean? All right. You can't be one of the, you can't be one of the boys in, in my inner circle. It might look different for other people, but you need to fix yours. Um, if, if I'm knocked down, if you won't give me a hand up and pray with me. If, if, if you won't pray with me, you're not my brother. I like you. I might even love you. I might go to the ends of the earth with you. But you need to be able to pray for me because I need it. Because I'm a pastor of a lot of people's spiritual journey. And I'm a, I am, a, am, above all, a child of God. But next, to a husband to a beautiful wife and a father to four amazing kids. I need your prayers. You need to be praying for me. And I need to be praying for you. All right? Because if I'm not talking to God about the enemy in my land, then I need my battle buddy and my brother praying for me, talking to God about the enemy in my land. And saying, you need to wake up, bro. I don't like the way that female is looking at you. You need to wake up, bro. I don't like the way you keep drinking so much. You need to wake up, bro. I don't like the language that keeps coming at your face. One or two times might be funny. But, bro, it's become a lifestyle to me. And then in their time with God, they're praying for me. That's what love looks like. The world's going to tell us that love looks like getting drunk and singing Bon Jovi, living on a prayer together, feeling good, like a cheesy Mick Ultra commercial, all right? And that's, yeah, that's a good time, and that's the journey. That's trash. In the toughest seasons of my life, I had men stop eating for days to intercede for me on behalf of God. 
They would not eat. That's love. That cross, that's love. So don't tell me that they're your best friend if you ain't praying for them. And all of you guys that are pheromoning it up and you like each other and you think people are cute, don't date the person if they ain't going to pray for you. Some people are like, should I date someone that's not a Christian? Well, can they pray for you? You know, we sound real religious when we say don't date someone that's not a Christian. Like, oh, how judgmental for Christians. Until you realize that, that the, the Bible says that prayer itself can melt the mountains. All right? That what we ask in Jesus' name, we can have. Don't you want somebody that's, that's, that's championing you on, on, to, to God on, his, on your behalf? Man, that's just powerful. I'm going to keep moving forward, though, because i got a lot to cover. I didn't mean to go off on that giant tangent right there. But we often do this. The struggle is how do we pray, right? Because, like, we get in, like, we, go, we come to Mezzanine, we go to church, and we get in these church struggles, like, we're going to pray for a little bit. And you got the one dude that's, like, he works for SpaceX. He's got a very logical mindset. He's like, Father, I lift up my brother here and his finances, and there'll be breakthrough. And, and then he might say something that you'll understand that only gets said in the church. Like, he has cattle on a thousand hills. It's like, what? He's a rancher? Didn't know that? Cool. Where are these hills? This is Florida, bro. That's Coco's dump. That's not a hill. <laughs> And then you have that girl that's like way too emotional. Father, ah, just be there for them. And just, ah. And you're like, oh, wow, I can't go there with you. You're so emotional. That's horrible and judgmental on my part, and I will receive it on that. And those people are cool. We get those. That's their personalities. But then you get the person that really shuts everybody up. It's that person that knows, like, every Bible verse, and they're using them and dropping the addresses out, too. Where they're like, yeah, Lord, I'm just, you know what? The word will not return void. No weapon. Isaiah 54, 17. And you're like, I'm not praying after that guy. No chance. No chance. You know, and it gets, and then you start praying. And you're like, God, you're so good. You're like good. You're like good to the last drop. God, you're like, you're like a good neighbor. You're there. God, you don't know what to do? That's what we do. And what do you do? Do you have to pray like King James? Where you're like, oh, Father, will thine hand move these will? We don't know. We don't know what it's like to pray. That's why when Paul says, present your request to God, he's actually saying this. Let your heart be known. I think we all can do that. I think we all can let our heart be known. I think that's much easier than having to think that there's this, now there's formats and templates out there. Yes, absolutely. And you should look into them if, you, if, you, if you're kind of insecure or whatever. Do that. I encourage that. That's a good thing. But you don't have to be married to that. Just let your heart be known. So God, because he cares, he wants to be a part of it with you. I love to, I love to like spend time with my kids. My kids are amazing. But they, they do stuff differently. All four of them, all under the age of nine. The oldest, my boy, David, who goes by little David. He, uh, he's one way. You know, we, we love to fight, okay. I love to wrestle with my kids. And when I wrestled with my kids, I got, I got a really cool-ish, okay, I'm just going to tell you. They call me Brown Thanos, all right? <laughs> they call me Brown Thanos. They're like, it's Brown Thanos, get him, yeah, yeah. And like the two-year-old is by far the Incredible Hulk, and he's like, ah. Oh. You know what I do, though? Because, like, I'm training them up, and I want them to be able to, to, to when, when, when something comes at them, that they don't get all sad and one statement or one word. You know what I do is when they're like, Brown Thanos must die, get him. Like, I say the most incredibly mean stuff I possibly can to hurt their feelings and debilitate their, their self-esteem. Like, my daughter, Avery, is so beautiful. She'll, like, she's, like, swear she's Black Widow. She'll come and attack you. I'll say, back to the kitchen, woman, and make me some bread. Whew, 
over and I'll throw her, right? Every lady in the audience is like, wow, what a sexist pastor. No, because you know what she does? She jumps on the couch after I throw her. She says, I will never make you bread, sexist brown Thanos. And it goes right back at me. I'm not raising a little coward. I'm raising a lioness. And then when a, the, when a lie is told to her, she's going to go right back at it with the tenacity of the kingdom of heaven. I'm not training them to back away just because somebody made them feel a certain way, made them feel beat down, talked down to them. You talk down to my kids in a couple of years, you, you might be in for it, especially when the little guy comes at you because he's a chunky fellow and he jumps off stuff. He like straight up knocked the wind out of me. He did. My son comes at me like, get over. I'm like, oh, I'm like, you big headed, cotton headed ninny muggin. Wow, and I'll throw him. We have to understand that people's words can make us feel a certain way. So we're trying something new tonight. That means I've just crossed the 30 minute mark. Ah, I've got so much left. I just crossed Brown Thanos. Like, you guys having a good time? Because that's what matters. You know, my kids talk to me differently. David, David, I gotta be side by side with him, and he's gonna he's gonna take a moment. David's gonna take a moment. He's not gonna come right out with it. He's gonna ask investigating questions. He's gonna take his time. He's gonna say, Dad. Dad, you know, that I was thinking, and you know that one time, and you got to be patient. You can't be like, hurry up, son. You just sit and listen. Not Avery, though. Not Avery. Avery's going to be like, here's what we're going to do, Dad. Here's my problem, and here's my solution. <laughs> Briella, Briella reminds me of what I need to do before she's ever asked me what she wanted me to do. She's like... Dad, remember, remember you were going to take me for pizza? I said, Dad, can we go for pizza? She's like, remember, we're going to go for pizza. Alex says, too. He just goes, poop. <laughs> I meet him there, though. I get it. I get what he's saying. A little bit like I am Groot, but I'm with him. You know your Heavenly Father knows how you talk? You don't have to be anxious about when you pray. He's okay that you might need to take your time. He's okay that you might have built a plan. He's okay that you already have a desire and a direction you want to go. He's okay that you might not know what you need or want to say. He's okay. He's okay. You know, he's incredibly thrilled about that you are taking a moment of time to spend with him and be with him and bring him in on the situation. Because so for so much of our lives, we run without giving any thought to God and bringing him into the moment. The fact that we just bring him into the moment. I love when my kids bring me in to the moment. I love it. I love it. We have the band come back up. I'll read this verse to you. Here's what Peter says. Peter says, humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand. This is 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Looking for someone to devour. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. You have to understand a lot of these things that come at you, the thoughts that are taking place in your head, they're not a reality. They're an attack because you might be moving on assignment. They're an attack because the devil wants to see you break. They're an attack. you got to take a step back and you got to be able to say, wait a second, that's not from my father and that is not good. So I am not going to grab a hold of it. I'm not going to bring it in. I'm not going to entertain it. I'm going to shut it down. Why? Because I'm going to call it is. And what it is is an attack 
on my mind and on my heart. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Why would Peter write this? Why would Peter say, under God's mighty hand? He could have used so many other descriptive pictures that he could have. But I think one moment in Peter's life transformed the way he saw and trusted God. He said, humble yourself under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. That he may lift you up in due time. I don't know about you, but if I was an astronaut, I would tell every person every time I ever met them. It's like your most obnoxious friend's Instagram profile. I'm an influencer. It's like, no, whatever. But no, Peter actually had bragging rights. Not only was he Jesus' best friend, John would debate him on that. But he is the only person to ever step out and walk on water with Jesus. No one in the history of humanity has ever done that. And as he beat the fear, as he beat the anxiety, and he stepped out in the wind and the waves, and his sights were on Jesus, and he was winning, he kept moving. But as we know, some of us, the story would change for Peter. And he would start to sink down into the water. And the more he would sink, the more afraid he would get. The harder the classes got, the more you're sinking. The, the more distant God feels, the farther you're sinking. The more rejection you take, the farther you're sinking. So you finally see the water is up to your neck and you are going down, you are going under, and you are losing hope. Fear and anxiety has fired back on your water walking moment. Some of you got accepted to college. Some of you got accepted into jobs. Some of you started relationships, and they're not going the way you thought they would go. And you feel like you're about to drown right now. That's why Peter says, humble yourself under God's hand. Under God's hand. Why? It's because it's Jesus Christ himself in the sinking moment that would take his hand and grab Peter. And he'll grab you. And he'll pull you out of that fear. He'll pull you out of that drowning. He'll pull you out of that anxiety if you will just let him and trust him. Peter was making no mistake when he wrote this. It was not an accident. He was remembering a moment that he may lift you up in due time because Jesus is not going to let you drown. Do you believe that, Messiny? then we need to walk in that. We need to walk in that. Why don't we all rise back up to our feet? Let's get back up to our feet. I'm going to do the same thing I did last week. I'm going to do the same thing I did last week. We're going to go back into worship, and I'm just going to camp out. And if, Thanks, buddy. And if you've had fear, you need prayer for anything. If you are here and you need prayer for anything, come down and get prayer. Let's not waste any time. Let's take it right to the throne room. I don't care. My wife's right there. If you're a girl, she'll see. Well, we can pray together. It's fine. If you're a boy, we can pray together. If you see yourself as something different, we can still pray together. You know how I'm ready for prayer? I got water and a breath mint. Let's do this. But let's not leave here with the chains of bondage, of fear and anxiety on us, of doubt, of lack of trust, of thinking that God is something that he's not besides the heavenly father that loves you and cares for you, that you can cast your fears and anxiety onto him. Let's worship him.